where tonight, tonight we are telling tales about telescopes, telephones, and any number of tales. So let's meet our wags. Bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, it's Rob Beckett. <laughs> like a dog with two tails, it's Sarah Milliken. <laughs> Shaking his tail feather, it's Delisa Chaponda. Making a head or tail of anything. It's Alan Davis. <laughs> Let's see what tales the buzzers tell. Rob goes. Tell her about it. Tell her you feel. Oh, we're off. Sarah goes. <laughs> tell me why it ain't <laughs> the I love this radio station. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, Delisa goes. Tell me why I don't like Monday. I don't like Monday. <laughs> Up in the way, and Alan goes. <laughs> okay, before we actually start, I'm going to give five points to anybody who can name the person that Alan's buzzer was written about. William Tell Overture. Is exactly right. Five points. No, so here's the thing. Well, what? I was gonna... what? I what? knew that. You knew that. <laughs> but you need to be quick, my darling. That's the thing I tried to explain to you. <laughs> but it was a sort of a test. Boomtown rats. <laughs> <laughs> Do you get points if you know the words to Alan's? Run away, run away with William Tell. Ring your bell and pet like hell. Is that not right? <laughs> You've called it Alan's song, like yeah. he owns it now. Um, in the 1960s, it was the theme tune to The Lone Ranger. And it was sort of a test to see uh, where people were kind of culturally. Did you think that was the tune to William Tell, or did you think it was the Lone Ranger theme? <laughs> so, what was the nationality of the first figure to shoot an apple from their son's head? Danish. Yes! 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 <laughs> I can just tell now, I get a feeling. <laughs> it's a little radioactive vibe emanates from a Dane. When they're, talking about, <laughs> they're talking about another Dane, it's weird. <laughs> was William Tell Danish? No, but he wasn't the first person. William Tell uh, was... He was the third <laughs> person to do it. No, he was... He was, he was like, Twelfth he was, person! <laughs> yeah. He was Swiss, is what I was looking for. <laughs> so the very first person that we know of to do this was a Dane. There was a guy called Saxo Grammaticus. That's uh, him. That's him. Yeah, oh. there you go. <laughs> no, Saxo Grammaticus. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Saxe. <laughs> Saxe, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and was he being forced into it like William Teller? Or was it just like. It wasn't him! Punishment! <laughs> <laughs> he wrote a saga about it. Oh, right. And the person he wrote about was called Palnatoki. So he's contemporaneous with King Harold Bluetooth. Is yeah, that him? Yeah. He's very young. <laughs> <laughs> also, he used a bow and arrow, not like a crossbow. Yes, so bow and arrow, absolutely right. And he once said, after a few mugs of ale, that shooting an apple off a stick didn't show much class. So the king, Bluetooth, ordered this guy, Palatoki, to shoot an apple off his son's head. So he put the apple on the son's head. And then he plucked three arrows from his quiver. And the king says, why'd you take three arrows out? He says, well, I'll tell you in a second. And he shoots the thing, hits the apple exactly. And the king says, the three arrows. And he says, well, the other two were to avenge my son against you in case I missed the apple on the head. And people say iPads are bad for kids. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not surprising that a Dane was one of the first great archers. Some of the bows found in swamps in Denmark, they're over 8,000 years old. Mm. And Danish archers may also have used poison arrows. They would have put mistletoe on the arrowheads. No. Not remotely surprised. <laughs> though because it's make it more romantic <laughs> oh. if you want to kill an auric do you want to kill an auric i don't know what one is yet. yeah no. the lord of the rings <laughs> I, I know it only because i was in a schoolhouse we had oryx kudus and elands so it's a kind of deer uh, well, close. It's a kind of cow. It's an early kind of cow. An okay. Early cow. Yeah. They're called calves. <laughs> Buffalo. <laughs> Show, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 
they don't exist anymore. They're gone. Okay. They're gone? Yeah, 1627 last one died. Oh. We saw some uh, horses in the field. No, we saw some cows in the field. My little boy said, look at those funny cows, but they were horses. But I can't remember if it was, look at those funny cows. <laughs> And they were horses. Or, look at those funny horses, and they were cows. I think it was that. Why don't you anyway. find out for real and then do it next week's show? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just a thought. <laughs> so probably you're thinking of Oryx, O R Y X. Y -X. Yeah, and it's not that. It's A U R O C H. So he was right about that. Oh, so yes. it was a deer, not an early cow. I'm going to give you a point for the misunderstanding. I wow. I wish that Take would it. work really? in love. Yeah. Just generally. Oh. <laughs> Understanding, oh. you get a point. <laughs> so you're not having a good time in the love department. Oh no, it's it's dreadful. Is it? <laughs> I mean, what are you looking for? We could put an ad out just now. <laughs> I'm looking it's, for it's someone understanding and patient. Oh god, oh. Why? no chance. Why are yeah. you a dick? <laughs> I'm, I'm married, and I'm still on the lookout for that. <laughs> Absolutely no such thing as that. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't exist. Doesn't exist. <laughs> I'm looking for an oryx. That's what I'm looking for. <laughs> <Is that what? laughs> yes. uh, another <laughs> amazing archer was an American music guy called Howard Hill. He's considered to be the greatest archer in history. He was also a stuntman. Here he is teaching Errol Flynn. And he even shot a prune from a volunteer's head. Was it a prune all the time? Just to just take him ages and eventually became a prune. <laughs> the bloke in Hollywood with a grape on his head while he did a raisin shot. Also, the shocking part of that story is from a volunteer's head. That shows both understanding and patience. <laughs> would you have a prune shot from your head by an expert archer? I would. You're the one for me. <laughs> Question to ask. What is it? The, is it what is it? Tinder profile? What Tinder is, the, is it? What is it? Swiping? Which is it? Which is it? Right to like? Some, I don't know. I'm, I'm married. Know, I'm looking at you. You're married. I'm married. I'm married. You're married. Oh, right no. is. Oh, you know. Is, yes. He knows. <laughs> he knows. It's not, I've got carpal tunnel. I just <laughs> say. Yeah. <laughs> 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 While well, crying and crying. I love being married. I think it's just the most marvellous thing. Oh, yeah, and me too, Lou. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. This, this, this presupposes, Rob, that she'll bother to watch. Yeah. <laughs> no, but her parents will. <laughs> oh. um, the greatest female archer in British history was undoubtedly Alice Lee. She was the national ladies' champion... Ooh. 23 times. She first won in 1881, and then she lost in 1882 to her own mother. Oh. <laughs> I know, right? Lambs are awful, aren't they? Just let her have one yes, thing. Yes, exactly. <laughs> OK, tell me this. <gasps> what use is a telepathic rabbit? Oh. What kind of rabbit? Is it the animal? Yes, it's a rabbit. <laughs> You were thinking of, I suppose it would know when to speed up, when to oh. slow down. Exactly, wouldn't it be amazing? Yeah. Because and Summers has gone psychic. <laughs> <laughs> In my limited experience, women don't always want rampant. <laughs> They've got to be understanding a patient, and you're rampant. <laughs> I don't think I've ever hit rampant. No, I've never hit Just rampant. Just plugging away. <laughs> <laughs> Rampant's far too yeah. sort of... I get to tiring quite early. <laughs> tiring rabbit? I'll have one of the tiring rabbits, please. <laughs> Slows down after two minutes. <laughs> well, that's when your batteries are low. Anyway, it's too much. Yeah. <laughs> you know what happens when you... I know, you I know, and it's always a pleasure. <laughs> so... Th it's always a pleasure. <laughs> So this is a true story, but you sort of can't believe it. So in the 1960s, the Soviets wanted a method to send emergency communications to submerged submarines. Because <laughs> you have to imagine... <laughs> Anybody know the film? <laughs> Anybody? Hunt Red October. October. You get that one. Hunt yeah. Red, Red October, absolutely. There's a lot of rabbits in yeah. that. Yeah, there was no rabbit. We, we made that up. I mean, if uh, he's telepathic, why does he have to use a radio to talk to him and he's right in front of him? <laughs> I will explain. Can you hear me, rabbit? So, uh, 
imagine you want to send a signal to the submarine, not just communicate within the submarine. Of course. When they're underwater, they cannot receive or indeed send radio signals, so they turned to rabbits. <laughs> this is a genuine <laughs> experiment. The hypothesis was that the mother-newborn bond existed as a sort of telepathic communication, right? So they took a mother rabbit from her offspring and they put electrodes on her brain and they placed her in a submarine. This is a serious experiment. And then they, on land, killed the baby. <gasps> oh, no! It's horrific! God, it's horrific. Whoa, 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 whoa. What did the baby do? <laughs> it died. <laughs> Just saying, you know, it I want died. to hear both sides of this story. Yeah. yeah, the idea is that the mother would be able to sense the baby's distress and that changes to her brain would signal to the submariners to surface and to radio home and receive instructions. That's a oh. genuine but, experiment. But did they have to kill it? Could they not have just made it do, like, hard maths or something? And it would be like... <laughs> <laughs> My baby's trying to do maths! <laughs> If you've got a claustrophobic rabbit, yeah. you'll just keep coming up. <laughs> it's time to go up! It's time to go to the surface! <laughs> I think they're, they're all right in holes, though, aren't they? Rabbits? That's, I don't know much about rabbits, but they don't mind a burrow, do they? I think they don't mind. <laughs> yeah. I think they're all right I with that. I think that's fair, Rob. You don't get many rabbits at home going, I can't be in here, I can't be in here. Yeah, it's all been closed in. <laughs> it's all dark. Oh, yeah. oh. <laughs> all dark, little tunnels everywhere. I'm a rabbit, I can't live like this. <laughs> Do you believe in telepathy? Do you guys, anybody believe in it? Yeah. So researchers at the University of Washington and Carnegie Mellon University in 2018, they demonstrated actual telepathy while playing the game of Tetris. They had two players wearing what's called EEG caps, that's electroencephalography, and they can detect electrical activity produced by their thoughts. And so they watched a game happening and they simply thought about what moves should be played, oh. right? Then there was a third player wearing the transcranial magnetic stimulation cap, and he received the thoughts and then moved the pieces, um, despite not being able to see the screen. And the experimenters reported an 81% accuracy in the moves made. Now, if it could point to a future where there is brain-to-brain -brain interfaces, imagine the possibility of direct communication for people who are deaf or in other ways impaired. It would be incredible. Yeah, that would be amazing, but I don't want anyone knowing what's going on in here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the world would fall apart if people knew all the deviant thoughts that... Uh, but that's just Twitter, <laughs> isn't it? That's just... <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly true. I can sometimes tell when my husband's about to talk. I don't right. think that's telepathy, though. It's a little breathing thing, I think. Yeah. I think it, that's what it is. You can hear him behind the tape. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's that under the floorboard, Sarah? <laughs> genuinely decided to not say the thing he was going to say right because it wasn't worth it no. but because i've gone what are you going to say he has to say it and i go well why did you say that and he goes well i wasn't going to say it and you made me say it so that's you're... where my marriage is at <laughs> yeah. is it telepathy yeah. when you know you need a poo <laughs> it wouldn't be telepathy if you knew that sarah needed a poo <laughs> yeah it, it would depend how far you were from your own ass so the whole <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but tall people might be further away. So, telepathy. Yeah. Uh, telepathy You'd call it telepathy far... anyway, wouldn't what? you? Telepathy. 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 Hang on, I've got a little bit of telepathy happening. Where's your toilet? <laughs> but if you know you'll need a poo later, that's precognition. So, if you could time it, like. Okay, stop! Got... <laughs> <laughs> that would be like if you just had Weetabix. Is Weetabix like instant like that? No, no, it's you know you're going to have one later and it's. Gonna be decent. I was at boarding school, and one of our matrons, she was a cow, uh, she. Or was it a horse? <laughs> she, had... <laughs> she, she had Weetabix with jam on it. Oh, what a m And she'd nutter. just chew it. Yeah. You've got more chance of building an house with that than eating it. <laughs> uh, telepathy has finally become a reality. Wow, Alan, that's. Disgusting. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> from telepathy to telescopes, why do astronomers hate Alan? What? Oh. <laughs> what? Is Alan a cloud? Oh, that's just, we're oh, sort of heading that? in the right. Oh, I Hello. Think it was th yeah. this Alan. The, the most annoying Alan I know is Alan Key, when you're trying to put something together, the Alan Key. Oh, the Alan Key. Oh, I thought yeah. it meant a bloke called Alan Key. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> yeah. It would be very annoying, wouldn't it? Yeah. Some bloke comes around every time you buy something from Ikea. Hello, I'm Alan King. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it is an acronym. So... Oh. 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 Is it something to do with the sky? <laughs> You're so quick. Yes, <laughs> it's artificial... Low, a low something? No. Artificial low light M. at night. It's artificial. a huge oh. problem for no. astronomers. Uh. And that means that telescopes for astronomers have to be placed somewhere away from cities. So one of the largest telescopes ever used in the UK is the Isaac Newton's, about two and a half metres, this telescope, it was moved to La Palma in the Canary Islands in 1979. Oh, you can get an app on your phone now, it tells you where everything is. <laughs> First holiday with my now husband, he pointed out things and I thought he knows a bit about it and I only know a few things. <laughs> 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 um, and he said, he said, there's Orion, and I thought, I know that one. Then he said, there's the North Star, I thought, I know that one. Then he said, there's the plough, and I thought, that's me done now. Everything yeah. else is learning. Yeah. And he stood for ages, and then he went, there's another plough. And I was like, he doesn't know any more than I do! <laughs> I saw the Northern Lights in Iceland, and it's better on Google. So the cameras are so advanced now, they're seeing more than my eyes can. And some bloke showed me his camera, it was amazing. Yeah, it and I was like, well, why don't I, why don't I just send him and look at it in the morning? <laughs> <laughs> it's the adventure of it. It was cold. No. And dark. <laughs> we thought we saw the Northern Lights. We're driving through Northumberland, where there's not a lot of Alan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's green and purple. We're going, wow, look, the Northern Lights, this is amazing. And uh, it turned out it was a nightclub in Newcastle doing a lot of... The thing about light pollution, it has a devastating effect on animals. So birds, for example, that migrate at night, they usually navigate by moonlight and starlight, and that can put them off course. And it's sad as well, because uh, turtle hatchlings, if there's too much light beside the seashore, they get confused, because they're guided by the reflection of the moon and stars on the water, and they go the wrong way. Idiots. <laughs> But why don't the turtle mums lay the eggs a bit nearer the sea? So it's right at the end of the beach. Don't why are you always chance. blaming the women, Rob? Well, <laughs> <laughs> why don't they just go to the maternity ward? Yeah. <laughs> just lay them in the sea. <laughs> why don't they just lay them where they want to and the man turtle move them along? Where yeah. the hell are you with all of this? I'd, I'd move it. Would if I was a man turtle, I'd move it. <laughs> There's a special thing about the Essex village of Thaden Boys. Does anybody know what it is? They don't have any streetlights. Yes, they don't have streetlights at all. They decided against streetlights when they were offered them in 1926, and since then they've had numerous referenda to decide whether or not they're going to have them, and each time they have voted to keep Alan out. Yeah. Wow. Oh, yeah. wow. Really? My Uncle Pat lived there. We used to go there for Sunday lunch. It's terribly nice. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe uh, up there, story. that's the golf that's the golf course. <laughs> I didn't know what that was. No. <laughs> All those sand bunkers. I know. <laughs> and they're houses. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm just looking to see if there's any cows. <laughs> <laughs> they used to have funny looking cows at the end of their garden. <laughs> <laughs> My aunt and uncle. When you say funny looking horses. Horses. <laughs> <laughs> right. Which are the most interesting tales of the sea? I would have said mermaids. Because you're like, oh, a human with fish the at the bottom. It's just, I don't know what, where, it, where this mythology came from. It's fascinating. So, I'm not talking about stories. I'm talking about a different kind of tale. Oh. oh. Uh, ah, T-A-I-L. Oh. What I nearly said was, what's that fish that's shaped like a horse? <laughs> <laughs> Seagulls. That's a funny cowfish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in, in, in the aquarium in London, they have them in a long tube, and they just go up and down. My mum didn't think they were real. What did you? She think thought they were? they were like some sort of magical Disney character. And then we went to the London Aquarium, saw a seahorse, and lost her mind. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the equivalent of going to London Zoo and seeing a Shrek. <laughs> It's a seal, so she was like, no, yeah, they're the things. Is that her introduction to the natural world through Disney? Is that well, yeah, pretty much, yeah, when you grow up in Abbey Wood. <laughs>
<laughs> but they hang on to things with their tails. That's what came to mind. They do, darling. Yes. And there are lots of amazing things that sea creatures can do with their tails that maybe we didn't know. So humpback whales, for example, talk to each other by slapping their tails onto the water. So a single whale sometimes jumps clear out of the water and slams its body down like that. And it does it when it's approaching a large group. And the large group tends to do smaller, repetitive tail slaps just before a new whale joins the group. So when you say single, you mean one and it's all? No. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, oh, sorry, I'm it's, just it's, you. it's, it's yeah. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not picky. I'll take a whale. <laughs> they also slap more often when the wind picks up, and I guess it's probably because I'm the same. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what's fascinating is that most likely they could be passing on information related to migration, to breeding, to feeding. This is not something I ever thought I'd say out loud, but humpbacks also slap their bodies on the water to dislodge pubic lice, which can grow alongside barnacles on their genital slit. Wow. Whoa. Oh, yeah. I think that is how more big are whale pubic lice? They're probably like this gigantic. Big as you, Delisa. Big, yeah. big as me. <laughs> One of them could be good for you. <laughs> <laughs> He's dating a pubic lice. Whales, <laughs> they can talk to one another. They can communicate over vast distances. Yeah, they're amazing. Why do we assume that when one slaps its tail in the water, that's a conversation? He's clearly shaking his life off. But it feels like gossip, doesn't it? It feels like yeah. they were chatting to come each here. other. Yeah. But it's like, oh, see her over there? Yeah. She's getting rid of her pubic lice. <laughs> they're just sort of cleaning themselves up to meet a new group, like a, you know, it's like fun. a sink wash at yeah. the end of a day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what are you putting in the sink? I knew that was a risk of this show. <laughs> the line and the line is I... she your cock in a sink <laughs> <laughs> um do you remember there was a 1990s fashion uh, sarah for a whale tail do you remember what a whale tail was, was I, it? I sort of sidestep all fashion but sure yeah it's showing your knickers um above your your jeans that there oh, oh, oh is that what it's called my knickers don't look like that sandy <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes no. tucked in me bra, sure. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't, doesn't look like that. If it goes to the lawyer, you'll show your blowhole. That's. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> if it's thin like that down the back, is yeah. it thin like that down the front? Yeah. <laughs> in my experience, I say it's a mixed bag. It's all different. Um, Did you call it a mixed bag? It's a mixed bag. <laughs> it's all different. <laughs> um, let's go back to fishtails. What does this animal use its tail for? Wow. Oh, wow. That's, yeah. wow. that's that... a bird, though. That's not... You know. <laughs> the, the horrible thing is that that's been dropped. Oh! <laughs> a thresher shark and it's astonishing it hunts with its tail which Whoa. makes up half its body okay and it actually accelerates towards a shoal of fish it then lowers its snout and flips its tail over its head at speeds of up to 80 miles per hour and it not only tries to hit the fish but it creates shock waves to knock unconscious any fish that it misses it's incredible I can't even peel a satsuma while I'm driving at 70 miles <laughs> <laughs> this big orange farm where you've been trying. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this fish is called a dusky frilgoby. Hello. Yeah. Those are very kissable lips, I They're think. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> That's just a very apologetic face. Yeah. I've just done something. Yeah. <laughs> Please, Gary, excuse me, I've got a contact lens. Can you see it anywhere? <laughs> So, this is a dusky frilgoby. It uses its tail to sweep something away. What do you think it might be? The sand at the bottom of the sea? No, it's not sand. So, this fish found in the coastal waters of the Indian and Pacific Oceans? Litter. Litter. Are getting rid of rubbish? Yes. Well, it's what they consider to be rubbish, so oh. they're heading in the right direction. When mating, a female lays her eggs in a nest and mm. the male then spawns over the top of them, right? And then he just walks away. Oh. He does. <laughs> he does, because he doesn't do childcare. Anyway, <laughs> there are what are known as sneaker male frill gobies, oh. and they lie in wait. They're smaller, but with larger testicles. <laughs> 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 this is an important detail. On to your profile. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> with larger testicles. <laughs> Give someone patient to understand. <laughs> <laughs> He's about to get killed. <laughs> so, anyway, 
Right, so these sneaker ones, the smaller ones, uh, yeah. they will sneak onto the nest and ejaculate their own sperm over the eggs. But no. if the original oh, male notices, he will chase the sneaker away from the nest and use his tail, which is like a brush, wow. to sweep oh, the God. sperm of the other... It's like a biscuit at boarding school, this. <laughs> of daring do what's the most heroic thing ever to happen in argos oh ah what the president of gambia yes he used to be a security guard at argos well that's wonderful that's fantastic isn't it yes <laughs> i i imagine I... when he was elected they didn't write names they just wrote down numbers <laughs> <laughs> so was he massively overqualified for argos or really <laughs> I am actually talking about the city of Argos. Is, is, is the country of Argos like the shot where it's sort of inside the country of Sainsbury's sometimes? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there is a city called Argos. City, sorry. It is the oldest continuously inhabited city in Europe. Stop it. Yeah. It is in the Peloponnese. Do you know where that is? No, what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> so this is a marvellous story. It's the story of Telesilla. Uh, so she's an ancient Greek poet. We're talking about around 500 BC. The Spartans were advancing on the city of Argos and they had defeated the Argivian army. So if you're from Argos, you are Argivian. If you go shopping, you could say, I'm going to do some Argivian shopping, OK? <laughs> and Telesilla decided to create a makeshift dad's army. Actually, it was more of a mum's army. She dressed all of the townswomen in men's clothes. She gave them makeshift weapons and she stood them on the walls of the city alongside all the young boys and the old men too, too old to fight. And the Spartans arrived thinking it's going to be an undefended city, but they were forced to halt in front of this huge women's battalion. And they tried, you know, making chilling battle cries to intimidate them and so on, but the women stood firm um, and the Spartans realised that they might lose. And then, even if they did win, who wants to win against a whole mass of women? And so they retreated. And Argos celebrated with an annual festival where all the women dressed in men's clothing. Mm. I think it's a oh, wonderful it. story. So the store name Argos comes from that very Greek city. And I, I know this. It's Go. because they all had tiny little swords. <laughs> <laughs> That's why they have That's... little pens in Argos. <laughs> 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 They don't have those little pens anymore. It's all. I know, it's, it's all, all digital these digital. days, isn't it? The glory days of the they pen. They don't even have the catalogue. Do you think they shave their armpits? <laughs> what I like is the detail that you are focused on. We've got that recycling food bin. <laughs> One hand in the air. This is not Just how you make a speech. It's very distracting. Going, has uh, anyone seen my other leg? The, the... <laughs> <laughs> it's behind you. What? <laughs> Uh, so the store name comes from the Greek city. The guy who founded it, Richard Tompkins, was holidaying there. And uh, he was trying to think of a name, and he realised if he called it Argos, it would be really high up in the alphabet. Should have called it Aardvark. <laughs> <laughs> but we no longer have the great uh, catalogues. 2021, uh, they went. I do like 2018 when Alan Carr was on Desert Island Discs. He chose the Argos catalogue <laughs> as his book. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> I used to cut all the stuff out for Christmas. That was how you did your Christmas list. What? You just cut them out, and that's that, instead of presents, you got just the. No. Little... <laughs> So we'd cut it and stick it on the, the letter to Father Christmas. Did you? Yeah. Would you not just write a list, darling? Seems like a lot of work. Oh, yeah, well, yeah, I've got to learn to write then, haven't you? Uh, <laughs> that's my little hassle. Anyway, moving on. Now, why would a telephone company ask their customers not to use the phone? Well, nowadays, mm. the phone is just a relic in your flat. Because we're all on mobile, but you still have the physical phone. I don't have a landline. I, I once had to do an interview on it, and it's so awkward, I had to lie on the floor. <laughs> because it's just there. I don't know why it's there. It's, Pick it's... it up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 the ring! Yeah. The one you're struggling well, with the... dating. <laughs> Hello, do you want to go for a drink? <laughs> <laughs> well, then when he has a drink, it's just he has to get down to it. <laughs> You know they're going to phase them out? What? The landline, they're going to phase it out. I haven't got a landline. You've said that, Rob. We ignored it the first time. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us one of your dreams. <laughs> Do you know, when I was a child, we had a small holiday home in rural Denmark, and our telephone number was five. <laughs> And if you wanted to ring Copenhagen, you had to book three days in advance. No. Yeah. Wow. Have I told you? I've got a landline. Have you? 
Do you have a mobile? No. <laughs> I just sort of just wait. <laughs> Did I just get it telepathically? <laughs> Everybody needs a poo! Yeah. <laughs> anyway, the question was, why... A long time ago, um, what, why would a telephone company ask customers not to use the phone? Is it something to do with a phone box in the picture? So no, that Because people always have to have a wee as well, don't they? Because they go in for a wee and they're like, might as well ring somebody. <laughs> Going for a wee? Oh yeah. They always well, somebody has, because if you go in one, they always they smell, they smell very like strongly. Food. Superman, I feel sorry for. They should just be connected directly to the sewers. Just yeah. have a drain in the bottom of them. Yeah, yeah. I once went into a phone box and I held the phone up at my ear, and when I pulled it back, somebody'd squashed half a mince pie into oh. the oh. Yeah, that was a lucky find. <laughs> <laughs> Was it Christmas? Not that kind of mince pie, like proper mince. Proper mince. Yeah. Beef. Yeah. <laughs> Gravy and everything. I'll take yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine the angry phone call. <laughs> Bit of pie. Don't you shove that pasty in my ear? <laughs> Don't you shove that pasty in my ear? We are talking about the Spanish flu outbreak in the 1910s. And what oh. happened was telephones oh. became it's... such a crutch for the isolating population that when operators started to get sick as well, uh, the whole system began to creak. Up until then, lots of US phone companies, for example, had encouraged people to chat. And people were encouraged not to go to the shops but to order by telephone. That had never been done before. That was brand new. Some kids received their education via the telephone and people were even encouraged, I love this, to ring their local newspaper to get the news of what was going on. <laughs> and the phone system then was operated manually by uh, entirely by women actually and when they started to get sick there was nobody there to connect the calls and so they sent out cars and even they had newspaper ads saying please don't use the phone because the system simply can't cope with it now here's something incredible about telecommunications when he was on campaign napoleon had a mobile device that could send text messages how do you think that worked did he have a long line of people who just passed it down? <laughs> like, did he? Well, his whispers all uh, the way along. OK, so, so you are heading... Stop it. Stop a it. Point. I must, Stop it. Am I sleeping around the point? <laughs> well, it's like having a Labrador on the show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> OK, it is to do with the line of something. Did he... He'd watched whales, so he got the tail of his jacket and he flapped <laughs> it. <laughs> Everybody in the army <laughs> all flapped it and the message went... Did he just write on a bit of paper, I need a poo, and then pass it along? <laughs> <laughs> was, it, was it flags? Whack up a flag, pass on the message, another flag, another flag all the way home? OK, I am going to give you a point, cos that's as close as we're going to wow. get. I think yes! As early as 1791, France had means of sending messages across the country and they used a system called optical telegraph. So, giant wooden towers with long arms and at the height of the optical telegraph's popularity, there were 556 towers across France. So, on a clear day, you could send messages 75 miles per minute. Yeah. So, basically, each one had an operator who moved the arms to represent a letter, and then the person at the next tower would spy the symbol through a telescope and then relay the message on to the next tower. But what's amazing... Napoleon took a small version of this system with him on his invasion of Russia, and it meant that he basically owned a mobile device that could send text messages. I wow. mean, it, it is astonishing, really. And the arms of the telegraph in that instance, the mobile one, were attached to the tent in the camp. Uh, I have to say it had limited uh, practical use. You'd need hundreds of man stations if you're going to send a message from Moscow to Paris or whatever. And apart from the sketches, we don't have much evidence that it was used, but I still think... It's amazing. The first two optical telegraphs, they were invented by an engineer called Claude Chappé. There he is, child at the Place de l'Étoile in Paris. They were destroyed by angry mobs who thought they were uh, communicating with royalist uh, sympathisers. Mm. Like the first 5G tower. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly <laughs> like that, darling. I don't know if it's an urban legend. OK, go for it. But I'm probably at the right place to find out. Did Napoleon also invent mayonnaise? Uh <laughs> Which is what I'm here for. Yeah. <laughs> I'm afraid that is an urban myth, but he certainly was very concerned about food. But mayonnaise, no. I'm going oh. go to go Maybe that's all the messages. I've invented mayonnaise! <laughs> <laughs> He's trying to make horseradish. <laughs> cow radish. Yes, yeah. 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 Silly cow radish. Uh, yeah. Silly cow radish. <laughs>
Now, it's time for the tall tales that we call general ignorance fingers on buzzers, please. Who won the last battle of the Napoleonic Wars? Tell her. W Wellington? Uh. <laughs> what, what? Duke of Wellington won the Battle of Waterloo? Yes, that, that is correct, but it wasn't the last battle. Oh, oh, oh no, no. Delisa, how embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> Now. Now. <laughs> I think, to Lisa, that even Napoleon looks embarrassed by your answer, doesn't he? He's like, yeah, oh, no, no. No. I can't believe he said that. What's, what's that? His last battle with himself. Oh, wow, deep. <laughs> <laughs> the final battle of the Napoleonic Wars was something called the Battle of Wavre. So French reinforcements were on their way to Waterloo, which they didn't even know had already ended, and the Prussians tried to stop them, and the French technically won the battle. But by then, since Napoleon had already retreated, there was no need for any soldiers uh, to mm. advance. And contrary to what Abba claimed... <laughs> just where, which is where I get my history from. <laughs> Napoleon did not surrender at Waterloo. In fact, he still... What? That, yeah, he still... I know. I've had a word with Bjorn about it. <laughs> <laughs> no, Napoleon did not surrender at Waterloo. He retreated to Paris to rally support for a counterattack, but he wasn't able to get the support. And then, in the end, he boarded the HMS Bellerophon and headed for St Helena and oh. exile. When the temperance movement was formed, what did they want to ban? Well, I'm going to say booze. And... Yeah. <laughs> the answer is nothing. They didn't want to ban anything they at all. They didn't want to ban anything. Oh. No, it began in the 1820s, and the whole idea was that they didn't want to ban alcohol. They just wanted people to temper their alcohol. Oh. So it was booze then. Well, they didn't want you to... <laughs> they, they were fine with things like beer. Yes. Um, booze. <laughs> <laughs> They just wanted you to drink less, not ban it. Less what, Sandy? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> less booze, was it? It's less booze. <laughs> well, you're driving me to here, don't you? <laughs> anyway, the whole thing about the temperance movement, it was very much taken up in the United States as a sort of proto-feminist issue, because women were seen as bearing the brunt of the problem of a male drunkenness. And the Women's Christian Temperance Union, they adopted the mantra, the lips that touch liquor shall never touch mine. <laughs> that picture does not make you want to drink the liquor. Say <laughs> <laughs> <Hey>, cheese! <laughs> you know, the ones, the ones Have they had the drink or not had the drink? <laughs> Which one do you like the look of, Delise? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, had, look at that as a picture to. of patience and understanding. To, there is, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the lady at the surgeon with the hat. With yeah, the hat. I like, she's got... She, I like Griff Reese jones <laughs> 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 uh, This is probably a short film parody. Oh, so that's not the, the, yeah, yeah. the original. And I, I would guess there's a lot of men dress up as women. It was called The Kansas Saloon Smashers. It was a satire of an activist called Carrie Nation. She was a woman who went round bars and smashed them up with an axe. And it still had an effect. I was having dinner in a very nice restaurant in Maine, and the woman said, can I help you? I said, well, first, we'd like to see the wine list. And she said, honey, we're dry for 30 miles, and there are still counties in Maine where there is no drinking because of Carry Nation. 30 miles to the nearest liquor store. I managed it there and back in 40 minutes. Well, um, <laughs> some very strange places where you can't drink. So Jack Daniels, very, very famous drink from Tennessee, you can't drink it in Lynchburg where it's made. Oh. I know, it's just weird. There are still what are known as alcohol-restrictive counties in the United States. Oh, I thought it was just you couldn't drink Jack Daniels, but you could get plastered and everything. <laughs> oh, uh... <laughs> now, which is the world's longest animal? Oh. What? Tell me why. The Loch Ness Monster. <laughs> Even thought of that. Well, <laughs> I think you need a new guy on the firm. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna get a thingy, but is it a blue wheel? Yeah, it is. Oh, God, thanks, oh. <laughs> thanks for taking that exist? one for the team. Giraffe. <laughs> is it a jellyfish? Is it? Uh, did you say jellyfish? Uh, I yeah. said giraffe. <laughs> oh. So, series A, which is 20 years ago on QI. The lion's mane jellyfish was indeed the longest. Yeah, I remember, because it's got tentacles that go on for we miles. We keep discovering new things. So in series C, it was the bootlace worm, but 
in it's 2020. A... Drum roll, let's have a drum roll. Okay, here we go. <laughs> a new siphon of four was found in the deep ocean off the coast of Australia that is 120 metres long. Ooh. 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 Oh, that was a brass instrument. <laughs> Massive ones, they've got backache on the tube. Also, uh, how much does <laughs> length really matter? This is why you're single. <laughs> Don't put that really on your profile. <laughs> Basically, <laughs> it's a long string of thousands of smaller creatures called zoids, and their only job is to keep the larger creature alive. And some of them propel it along, and some might feed the other animal, others act like the gonads and so on, and they can't live on their own, which is why the large collection is seen as an individual, OK? A siphonophore or what? Uh, it's a funophore, yeah. He's in of... Lord of the Rings. <laughs> <laughs> Lots and lots of little creatures, but because they can't live as individuals, they are seen together as a like single... Like supporters. So, like... <laughs> <laughs> can't survive on their own. It's a, a siphonophore. <laughs> what I like is they're found along the coast of Australia and New Zealand, and the locals call them long, stringy, stringy thingies. <laughs> So, because so, they're all lots of different things all together, they make, yeah. make one. Yeah. Two blue whales mating. What are we talking about now, then? <laughs> if that went over 120 metres, is that a thing? Because it's yeah, two together? Yeah, I don't think whales mate end to end. That's the thing. <laughs> <laughs> what about, like, a whale human centipede? <laughs> I, think that, I didn't want to bring it up because of the, the dick in the sink stuff earlier. <laughs> but it's a fair shout. <laughs> Five blue whales banging. How long are we talking? <laughs> Blue whale orgy. Yeah. Do you know what? It's been my great first and last appearance. <laughs> really I can sort of imagine all these going left a bit, left a bit, right a bit. Where are you going? <laughs> Where are we going now? Where are we going now? Where are we going now? Ask the ones down the floor. Where are we going now? <laughs> I can't function on my own. Like a big conga. <laughs> ay, 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 ay. <laughs> Actually, not necessarily funny, but accurately, humans, we cannot exist alone. So actually all of us together you could if you beat if you, that. If yeah. you lived alone in a branch of Asda. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Survived for years, just grazing. Yeah. <laughs> You're allowed to graze in a supermarket. You can eat as much as you want as long as you haven't left. <laughs> I used to eat kilos of Bombay mix in Safeways. <laughs> Plumbing the depths leaves us staring at the abyss of the scores. In last place, a bit of a wreck with minus 27. Wow, that is bad. It's Alan! Oh, <laughs> In third place, sailing close to the wind at times with minus 12, it's Deliso! <laughs> In second place, barely keeping her head above water with minus 9, it's Sarah! Who had a blue whale of a time <laughs> <laughs> with four whole points in Rob? Yeah. So it's thanks to Sarah, Rob, Deliso, and Alan, and I leave you with a thought from the brilliant Mark Twain. Why shouldn't truth be stranger than fiction? Fiction, after all, has to make sense. Thank you and good night. <laughs> 